I'm doing this, uh, and I think you also, Thomas, are doing this not to to earn a lot of money because it's not a lot of money, and you need to be dedicated and really into the community. Uh, here in Norway and in Sweden, especially, is that when there is no live logs, people start to to complain and it's like, oh, cool. where is it? Because I I really want to see the course. I want to see what my friend did. How does live logs protect proprietary data like maps, map ownership? So what we see now in the orienteering community, and we have seen for the last like five, six, seven years, that most maps are geo-referenced because we are using LiDAR when producing the maps and so on. So everything True. is set up. Welcome, everybody. Today, I have a pleasure of talking with Mats and Tommaso, who are um, the people that are working currently on LiveLogs. Mats has been on the project from the very beginning. Tommaso has joined the project last autumn and he's one of the developers helping out on uh, in, in evolving the tool. So um, I invited them today to talk about this tool because in my personal opinion, this is one of the best tool we currently have in the orienteering world when it comes to post-race analysis. Not the only one definitely, but um, the one that has a very small entry barrier. And it's, you know, when I when it was first introduced to me, I was so in love with how the process of adding my track to the tool works and how seamless it is that I definitely at that point in time decided that I'm going to do everything in my power to make this tool as popular as possible and we kind of did it together with my brother that just came in <laughs> in Poland and I think the tool has been um, developing in terms of the range of users that are using it in Poland quite well recently and uh, and we will definitely keep pushing on and since i have uh, i have started this channel and uh, the channel has also a, a reach outside of uh, poland and many people from different countries are watching the videos i thought it will be quite an amazing thing to show you guys um live logs if you don't know it how it works what it looks like and what benefits you can get out from it so uh, we've already had some small chat that will go to the Patronite page uh, before we start this main part. And I've learned some interesting things already. Uh, for example, that Matt is the father or developer of many other tools that I have been personally using in, in my orienteering journey as well, like uh, wind splits, like quick route. So this already has been amazing. If you want to watch the Patronite part, then check out the Patronite in our link below. Also, if this is your first time to the channel, we will be talking about orienteering, running with the map and compass, an amazing sport. And if you want to explore more, there are lots of videos on the channel already. So just go to the video section and see what you can uh, find over there what interests you. And in, in, with this, I want to welcome you guys uh, officially, Matt, Tommaso, uh, to the chat. And uh, I will start kicking out with the questions that I've prepared for today's interview or today's chat. Thanks. Nice yeah. to be here. Yeah, awesome. thanks for having us. Awesome. A pleasure. Really a pleasure from my side. So um, let's start with one of the most important things. So for the people that have never heard about live logs, how would you describe it? What live logs is? Uh, well, uh, let me try to give an explanation. Then Tomas, you can uh, you can add yours. <laughs> uh, but basically, it's uh, um, it's a software platform uh, where you can see where you have been running uh, during your orienteering race. Um, you use your GPS watch, your sports watch that almost everybody uh, have now, uh, and you record that one, and then you, you transfer your GPS data to LiveLogs, and then the, that uh, uh, your route will be shown on the map and the course uh, on, uh, on the web, uh, so you can uh, look and compare to others. Yeah, I would just add that uh, LiveLogs is actually the, the easiest and, and faster and more uh, flexible tool that we have for doing this one at the moment in the in the orienteering community. Yeah, so my comment as a user of LiveLogs on this is that I really want to emphasize the part of how easy it is to get to your root analysis. So assuming that the event organizer will post the live logs uh, courses sometime either during the competition or, I, or after the competition. All I have to do as a user, which is so amazing, 
is that, you know, I just run my race, hit start at the beginning of the race, hit end at the beginning of the race. Um, then when the race ends, I just hit the, to save my track again on my watch. And then when I get back to my clothes and start changing up, my phone will immediately sync up with my watch because uh, of the Garmin Connect. I have a Garmin phone, so maybe for other uh, watches, uh, for other brands, actually, it, it, it may be a little bit different. But for Garmin, it just connects with Garmin Connect. The track gets uploaded to the database. And because live logs can be connected with my Garmin account, which I did, then my course immediately goes to live logs. And as soon as the event is published on live logs, I just can, can go to live logs, enter my events, and it's right there. I just click it and I can go to the analysis. No need for any photographs of the map, no need to do anything. I basically just record my race, synchronize it with my phone, and I'm done. And that's the part I love the most, I think. <laughs> Yeah, and that's the part that is also necessary for people that might not be as enthusiastic orienteers like we are uh, to contribute and to add their, uh, their tracks. And that is what makes the tool great because many people are using it and then it's, uh, you will have even more possibilities to analyze. Yeah, and also uh, when we're doing the uh, national, national team camps, for example, you know, the process is similar. We, we, of course, have the courses prepared beforehand. And as long as uh, we as coaches put them onto the live logs, and again, when you're, when you're putting the course to live logs, you can say, okay, make this course public at a specific um, hour and, and date, right? So if I have, for example, have a training session at 10, and I don't know that everyone will start by 10.30, then I can uh, just make the public, um, if the, the course available to, 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 to public at 11, for example, so that everybody, when they come from the race, and they synchronize, it's immediately there. And even when we hop on the bus and we start going, driving back to our accommodation, people can already pick, pick out, pull out their phones and start analyzing and, and compare where they went and, and how they did compared to, to the other runners. So that's definitely the part that I love the most. <laughs> uh, where does the name come from, come from, by the way, Live Logs? Yeah, so from uh, from the very beginning, it's very hard to give uh, something a name because that will be connected to the product. Uh, and we yeah. had uh, quite a few uh, alternatives there, but we ended up with live locks, which is a combination of yeah live uh, and locations. Uh, ah, so we don't just do uh, like post race. Uh, uh, tracking uh, but also you, you can have live if you if you're running with like a, a dedicated live tracker or your mobile phone for example so and we thought it was like a little bit catchy with the, that uh, uh, alliteration with live locks starting with l both, both of them and it was most uh, importantly it it had a domain name that was uh, uh, available uh, actually we had to buy it but it was, it was pretty cheap at that time so so that's something you need to have with, while going international that's funny, actually, how important this is, right? To have a domain available. <laughs> yeah. I struggle with this uh, sometimes as well. All right. Uh, who would you say is life looks for? Is it for beginners, for pro athletes, or everyone in general? Uh, I think it's, it's not only for, for beginners. For beginners, it's, it's a really great tool, especially for, for coaches, because you don't have to really, like, uh, most of the times, especially with youngsters, they're like, ah, I went here and then ah, I don't really remember what happened. But there with the with live looks and with the GPS tracking, you have uh, the certainty of where they were, what happened and why they went there. So you can you can really go into depth on some on some analysis. But also for for elite runners, there are uh, other tools that have been on the market uh, before. Uh, which are also used by, by elite runners and, and LiveLux uh, is uh, doing uh, the same or, yeah, as we said, in, a, in an easiest way. But also for, for elite, you can really see root choice. You can go into more detailed analysis, cut through segments of the, of the leg, cut through the segments of the, of the race. So you can see exactly which root choice or even which part inside the root choice was uh, was the best. Okay, so in general, we can comfortably say that this is a tool for everyone. And I, again, would totally agree because I think it's just uh, an amazing thing to use in your post analysis 
And that's, I feel like most people are using the live looks for. And um, I'm, I'm always saying that post-race analysis is a huge part of the process of getting better. So I'm talking in my videos, uh, we, we are talking about it heavily in the Orient Hearing Academy, which is like a small project inside into the forest I go. Um, the, I have like 20 something people over there and we are meeting every month and talking about different aspects of orienteering and definitely race analysis is a big part of it. Uh, so I think for everyone that hopes to get better and wants to have a chance of getting better as fast as possible, the post-race analysis is a super important factor and Livebox contributes to this tremendously. Yeah, and uh, I want to emphasize also the different areas of usage for, as Tomaso said, for beginners. I mean, that's more or less about the coaches to understand what they were doing out there because you can't follow them in a training. Yes, uh, uh, not everyone at least. <laughs> no, no. Uh, and then you can, if you have these live tracking devices, then you can give immediate feedback when they come back because you have, as a coach, you see what they do in real time and can, can give feedback directly and that improves learning. But for elite orienteers, and I can refer to that myself because I was in the Swedish national team for a few years, then it's all about to, to chase those small seconds that, that makes exactly. a difference. And then you go really deep into details and try to understand how you can improve and what, how to act in different situations. And, and then you, you use it in a little bit of a different way. But uh, regardless, if whether you are a, a beginner or a, an elite athlete or, or like a veteran or, or a young runner, you can get something from it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um... How has LiveLox impacted the orienteering community from your perspective? So we talked a little bit a, a little bit a little bit earlier about the feedback, and you said that the feedback has been tremendously positive. Uh, how how do you think the tool itself uh, impacted the community in general? I think it gives uh, it gave access to the to the analysis also to people who were not really like uh, going through the analysis or they thought they were not interested into the analysis and into the roots, but then having this one available, then they really started to, to love it and, and demand it because what we have uh, seen both uh, here in Norway and in Sweden, especially is that when there is no live logs, people start to, to complain and it's like, oh, cool, where is it? Because I, I really want to see the course. I want to see what my friend did, how I perform, how I compare to, to that one. So I think what we see now is that part is the really part of the orienteering experience. So it's, the event is not complete if there is no, no live logs. Yeah, and I would like to add also that in a general trend in, in the society in general that, uh, and, and like endurance sports, we have Strava that has been really influential and everybody yeah. more or less uh, are there. And it makes, at least for orienteering, it makes our sport, which is a little bit hard to understand and to grasp and to, to see what happened, it makes it more visible and understandable in some way, both for, for the people that are, are orienteers themselves, but maybe also for their, their friends and so on. It, it gets more understandable uh, and see what really happened out there in the forest. Yeah, totally agree. I, I, I love the summary that um, Tommaso gave, that the competition is not complete without the live logs. I really like it because I'm definitely one of the people who think that, you know, and whenever I go to the competition and I don't see a live logs after the competition, I, I always, you know, wait for half a day at least <laughs> <laughs> to make sure that I'm not pushing too many buttons. But then I'm going to the Facebook page of the organizer and like, when is live logs going to be available? <laughs> Yeah, and that's, uh, I think that is something that takes a little bit of time. So I want to say that you can prepare your Lilox uh, uh, data and add it to our service like well in advance. It will be yeah. protected there and it won't be uh, released until the, the time you, you decide. Uh, so you can do a little bit of pre-work there as an organizer. We all know that it's really, really busy during the race day. Yeah, exactly. So this is what we do when we're preparing training camps all the live logs are already there and we basically during the training camp we don't have to do anything regarding it it just publishes itself automatically at the set um, times and days so definitely the same uh, can be done for for the competition and I, and I also want to say that you know I I know that I'm probably a little bit annoying to some people by doing this 
but at the same time, I think it benefits really everyone. Uh, in terms of the people that are attending the competition for the reasons that Tommaso said. We can just, you know, see how other people ran compared to one another and spot our mistakes more easily. So it, it's, it's definitely helpful when you have every, everyone's track in one place rather than spread out through several different places or some people not available uh, online and you, you can't see where they went anyway. Uh, that doesn't benefit you at all. Yeah, and... Uh... The GPS tracks, it's they are of the highest interest right immediately after the race, right? Yes. Uh, you don't want to wait for it to, for two days because then you forgot a bit and then there is the next thing going on in your life. So so you want it here and now. So yes. <laughs> we, we really see that demand, as Tomaso said. All right, cool. Uh, let's move on. Mm, how does LiveLox compare to other software platforms um, that do the similar thing for orienteering? Um, what sets it apart? I think what we briefly discussed before is the the fact that it's, it's really easy, it's really fast to, to upload your, your GPS tracks. Uh, all the other services around, they require you to uh, go inside your Strava, inside your Garmin Connect, export your GPS, a GPX uh, file, upload it there. If the organizer didn't upload the map, then you have to upload yourself the, the map, the course. So it's um, there's a lot of steps to go through. And what uh, LiveLox does and what uh, I think we are working to improve uh, every time is to make it more easy and more fast so that you really don't have to, uh, to do anything and everything is, is there available. I uh, When we discuss with Mats, I like to, to tell that it has to be something that my mom can do, and she's not a tech person. She would not spend time to download the, the GPX and upload it and find the folder. Yeah. So it needs to be very fast and very easy. Okay. Um, is there any competition on the market that you would say it's like uh, an alternative to Livebox right now? Yeah, yeah would, for sure. Yeah. Uh, there are products, uh, and it's a little bit of different use areas of usage uh, and what differs uh, uh, I would say if, uh, from Livox to other products most of other products uh, are free and provided on more on a, on a like hobby basis uh, but I've, I and I've been doing that myself like re releasing open source software like like QuickRoot but at the end of the day uh, when you put so much time uh, in it you need to to um, provide a paid service at some point to to get it to be uh, sustainable over time uh, so i would say we are taking a little bit more let's say high level service uh, 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 approach whether other free services they are there uh, but you have to do a little bit more work yourself and it's not automated in the same way and um, so that might be a difference I think we will get there later uh, because I have a question about uh, different pricing tiers for live logs. Uh, but if you don't pay anything, I think that the access to live logs is not blocked for you and you can use it to some extent anyway, right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. And even for so the event organizers, they don't have to pay to post the event on live logs. And the individual user also doesn't have to pay to go and watch himself or other people's tracks, but there are some limitations when it comes to having no license to it, right? Right, uh, so what we offer- We, we can uh, go into the details yeah, later. Yeah, we, we can go it, but, but it's short, it's, it's a freemium service. So we offer uh, something for free, but if you want the whole package, you, you got to uh, sign up for a subscription. Cool, so let, let, let's go to the details of it later, but I just wanted to emphasize that even if you don't pay anything, you can still use live logs to some extent. Um, okay. Can you discuss any new features or updates that are currently in development for LiveLogs um, or that you hope to add in the future? And I'm smiling because that's probably going to be exciting. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, we have uh, we have a few ones. Uh, where should we start, Tommaso? Yeah, I think the one that were requested by by you and so to have some kind of a more social social way on the on LiveLogs at the moment is just you in front of the. Of the computer doing your things, but we would like, uh, and then is a little bit maybe uh, call it time consuming to find your friends. 
So something that we have um, that we are working and is have on the back of our head is to add the more community so you can follow your friend, like search your friend, follow your friends so that you have an immediate, uh, uh, you have it on, on your feed or you can see immediately where your friend were running. Maybe they are maybe not with you the same weekend, but they are running, I don't know, in Brazil, in uh, Great Britain, whatever. So you can see their map, their track. And, and so on, and you don't have to scroll through the event list or ask him well, which was the name of the of the event again. Uh, to have something something like this, I think this is one of the of the features that will come up. Yeah, and another one uh, would be some kind of uh, uh, speed uh, adjusting algorithm. So let's say uh, that uh, I am much slower than Tommaso, uh, but I still want to compare the technical performance. And then uh, we are trying to find an algorithm that speeds me up a bit and uh, lets uh, me have the same like base speed as Tommaso. And then we can really see what the uh, time difference are uh, technically. Uh, he will run uh, ahead of me like uh, half a minute on a short leg uh, otherwise. But now when we are speeding me up uh, in Livebox, then we can see those things, which I think will be very uh, fun for those ones that maybe didn't do their winter training so well. <laughs> yes, that's, that sounds amazing. And I'm thinking that maybe the work that you did on wind splits will contribute a little bit to this, because I think wind splits uh, also tries to do that to some extent. Yeah, exactly. So that's the uh, um, time loss calculation there, which is a pretty solid algorithm, actually, that has been there for a long time. Uh, for you, of, uh, for uh, the viewers that have been using WinSplits, you see those pink background uh, cells exactly. in the split time table, which is, uh, yeah, that's an indication you made a mistake there. Uh, now we have more data. We can see uh, if you're like, were close to the control and then uh, you went away for 50 meters and then you get back, then you can do a really precise calculations of how much time you lost. And you can also do a cal calculation and comparison to other runners, how this base speed is throughout the course. And you could use that in, in some, innovative ways. Obviously. Yeah, and, and I think that wind split somewhere in the background, it has to calculate like, a, as you said, base speed, because I, I've seen splits of people that are like kind of going slow throughout the whole race, but nothing gets highlighted in, in pink because they are just keeping their normal pace throughout their race, even though they are losing like 30% or on every leg. Exactly. So it's compared to your base level there and, and the legs that are uh, outliers in uh, in speed uh, and time compared to your normal uh, performance those ones will be marked as mistakes and then you apply your normal speed to those legs and then you got the, the time loss more or less yeah cool okay what are the features you have guys uh, <laughs> those ones are two of them that we have been discussing i think the, maybe the two most important uh, we also have been discussing uh, a little bit, and this is relating related more to uh, to relays and races for uh, for spectators. So uh, to have some live tracking uh, is uh, uh, poses a problem, as you know, because you don't want to show the map for for competitors that has uh, haven't started. Yeah. Uh, so to be able not to show data from the race. Uh, on a map or with the course, but still have some kind of uh, like virtual split times all the time to make it easier to follow a race, even though you can't show the map. Um, so that's something we, we are thinking of. That would be more for a, like high end uh, races. And, but, uh, then, but then probably the runner has to carry some kind of the device with. Yeah, exactly. So that's, uh, that's something that is needed then. So, but I think that would be a great improvement, for example, for these national relay leagues that are already uh, present in Finland and will be present in Sweden uh, next year. So, so that's something I have in mind to see how we can do it in, in completely new ways. We haven't seen that at all in the orienteering community before. So I, I, I want to dig a little bit deeper here. So what do you mean by completely new way? Because there are currently solutions that allow you to that just put trackers on, on runners, throw them into the forest and you have the live feed and you can like disable the map, for example, to show that just to track. Yeah, yeah. But, but still, you will, then you will see, uh, you will probably be able to find out where the controls are and you will reveal some of the secrets from an orienteering course, and we as orienteers, we would love to have a, 
uh, un an unspoiled uh, experience. We don't want to know anything about the maps and courses from the beginning. But maybe you, you could show that as a graph uh, that to see that now, now this runner is uh, at this very moment 35 meters behind, and now she's losing to uh, to one minute behind. And, and I see. So they, this not, is how not really, not really a tracking, not really a tracking, even with a blank map, but actually some different form of showing how the runners are performing. Uh, yeah. without actually showing the direction that where these are turning and so on exactly to show information that is relevant and interesting for you as like a teammate or spectator uh, but still not reveal anything and i haven't found uh, a good uh, like final solution to this or, or how to visualize it so i think we are really happy to receive any feedback uh, on how such a feature would be implemented interesting ne never thought never thought about it but yeah definitely interesting um, by the way, re regarding the community aspect that Tommaso, you were talking about earlier, uh, something that came to my mind, and I'm happy to share, is that it actually would be cool to be able to mark some of the athletes, runners as favorites. So that when, yeah. you, when you go to the race, uh, you can, instead of, you know, what I, what I usually do is when I go to, to the race to analyze uh, my category, for example, here in Poland, let's say I have 30 people over there, but I'm actually interested in seven of them. You know, and the, and the rest, you know, they are, for example, uh, a little bit slower. So they are track are not of that much interest to me. Uh, and if I could favorite some runners and then just uh, somewhere at the top, instead of unselect and select everyone ahead of another button, select just my favorite ones, that would definitely be helpful. I'm, I'm writing down. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's part of the com or the community. Yeah. Um, improvements we would like to to do and of course that would be uh, a little bit of uh, uh, privacy uh, parts as well here like the gdpr and so on so in our um, current user agreement uh, we haven't anything about that so we probably need to do some kind of small adjustment just to make this uh, this happen but we will solve this, that uh, definitely yeah, I mean, Facebook has it solved, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> All right. Uh, how does Livebox handle different types of course designs and what kind of data input is required to create them in Livebox effectively? So by this, I mean, you know, there are different kinds of orienteering races that you can have, like a standard orienteering race. You start at the start, finish at the finish, and then you have just control by control, but then you have uh, relay races, you have interval um, starts that you can do for the, for your training sessions. You have score allowed races, for example. Uh, is it all possible inside live blocks? Yeah, most of the different types of uh, races or events are supported, uh, but you might need to do a little bit of uh, tricks to get it to work in these special occasions uh, so for a like a standard event where you have unforked courses uh, one course per class and so on uh, then it's uh, very straightforward and we have sure. automated uh, the process there but you can you can do score uh, orienting or row gaming uh, you can do relays you can do these like special maps like corridors and so on uh, so it, it's possible but uh, then you you need to be a little bit creative in some sometimes and honestly uh, it's very hard to compare when you have like different loops and butterflies and and to be able to get something out of that because uh, then it gets really complex uh, as it is what kind of in input is needed to create a course in live logs yeah i think the, and this one is part of the make it easy uh, mentality so you can you can really put like directly the the OCAD file and then live will recognize that when you can import some uh, xml file from purple pen from OCAD you can also upload directly from OCAD and, and condense with the with the latest uh, OCAD you there is an uh, direct integration so you can do everything from from OCAD you don't even really have to export or or save anything from from there, so we have, yeah, some some good integration in in that sense. So there are many formats that you can you can uh, use and upload, and and then mm -hmm. if you want to have a very nice 
a view with the background, all your logos and so on. You can also import your uh, the, uh, course print or JPEG and, and PNG of the of the map so that the, the layout stays uh, as it is. Of course, it requires a little bit more uh, work. It's not just simply put the map, put the course and that's it. You also have to go export those ones, import that one, but it's some extra to make it more uh, fancy, let's say. But I mean, uh, it, it, the like export import, it's probably for this last part when you want to go with the JPEGs. I also, I, I think that then you also have to calibrate the map, right? Um, properly. You can export directly. I'm on, I talk about Ocal because it's the one that I, that I use the most. You can export uh, from OCA the JPEG file and then this JPEG uh, text file. So that uh, will kind of maintain the uh, I see. Yeah, the geo yeah, the geo referencing. And uh, so what we see now in the orienteering community, and we have seen for the last like five, six, seven years, that most maps are geo referenced because we are using LiDAR when producing the maps and so on. So everything True. is set up to to be exact uh, and then it's very smooth you don't need to do any calibrations and, and say that this part of the map uh, com uh, is connected to this part in a satellite image and so on like uh, you do otherwise um, so that helps yeah true but um, I also I also like that there is a possibility to calibrate the map when you have like a pdf or a jpeg and I have been using it on some of the training camps for example we were in Romania last year, and I didn't have the uh, OCAD files for the maps, so I had to do uh, some uh, some workarounds. And then, you know, I can go in the tool, mark those points on the map, mark those points on a Google Google view, right? Google view yeah, next yeah. to it. Yeah. And if I if I can spot like how how many actually is recommended to to pick over there? I usually go with like seven. Something like that. Ah, uh, yeah, I I'm usually lazy and go for two or three. So <laughs> depends on okay. how accurate you want to be. But um, if it's a really an old map, uh, the map will have like uh, distortions within it, so it will be impossible to have get it right in every place. So. Yeah, yeah. I I remember that if I went with two or three points, sometimes it wasn't exactly right in all the areas of the map. So then I started to go like. Some, some points all around the map and I usually settle on, on about seven. But anyway, uh, one thing is for sure when you, so I am, I am not using um, OCAD. I don't have a license for it. So I didn't test the, the integration. I saw it's there, but I didn't test it. I'm using purple pen, but even with purple pen, I feel like like the, the standard competition, if you, if you want to record the standard competition in live logs, it's still super easy. So what I have to do is just upload the map and it goes there then I upload the purple pen file with the courses and then it immediately sees all the courses with all the controls. I just basically save it and it's there, right? Yeah, it's, uh, that's a pretty accurate description. Um, so, and um, I mean, it's not uh, by, by chance uh, that it's so easy because we really put a lot of effort into making it easy for organizers uh, because if it would be hard with lots of exports and imports and you have to do this and that, then organizers won't add their, their maps. They, they, it's just too much work. Yeah. And the same thing for uh, also for participants to add your, uh, your routes. It has to be super easy. Otherwise people won't do it and then it won't take off and you won't see much usage. Only the nerds will do it. Yes. All right, um, let's go back to live looks tiers and talk about them a little bit. So what tiers do you have and what are the differences between them and what is included in the free version of live looks? Yeah, okay. So in, in March, we actually uh, released some, some new uh, features and, and we changed a little bit uh, this, uh, this structure. As uh, Matt mentioned previously, live look is premium. So you get some, some features for free. For example, you can see uh, one track at the time, either your track or someone else's track at the time, and uh, and the longest leg in the in the dual uh, feature. But then if you want to compare more track at the same time and then have this uh, dual feature for all the for all the legs inside the, inside the course, 
then you need a personal subscription, which uh, stands for some uh, 50 euros per, per year at the moment. Uh, and then we have a, a club subscription, which is more for, uh, let's say, organizers or, or clubs. So it's connected to a, a specific club or specific organizing team. And uh, by uh, you can either uh, buy some five uh, live tracker and then it is included or then for, for 300 euros per, per year, all your trainings and, and smaller uh, uh, local competitions are included. So you see all the tracks at the, at the same time. You can compare in the leg analysis uh, all the tracks at the same time, but there is still a restriction for this uh, dual uh, feature. And I think it's important to emphasize that as an organizer, it's completely free. You can add your uh, uh, your event there without paying paying anything, and also to just as a participant add your uh, route there. It's also completely for free. You can see your your route, or you can see others. But what you can't do without the subscription uh, is to uh, to compare two or more routes. Uh, simultaneously so that's the restriction yeah so you have to switch between one and the second and but each of one of them will be uh, displayed individually exactly so it's that's more of a, a quick route experience it's just uh, you you see one track at a time and uh, you can't compare really so that's what we are charging right and um it, it, it came to me a little bit as a surprise when you changed the tiers, uh, I think somewhere at the end of, of last year, because I, I remember that previously we were always able to go and compare everyone at the same time from, from the category and, and see how they were um, running in the, in the legs tab, right? Uh, but then, um, then I think it's changed that only when you have the club subscription or the individual subscription, sorry, when you have the club subscription, then you're able to compare it for the sessions that are organized and posted by the club, am I right? Exactly, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. Uh, the organizer that is uh, uh, making a difference there. I mean, as an organizer, if you buy this club subscription, which now is priced uh, 300 euros, uh, then all your small events, uh, we have a restriction for like 10 classes in the event, then uh, it will be like free for anybody uh, to see that one for uh, with multiple routes at the same time. Yeah, so it, it works perfectly for you know clubs that organize their own trainings, and then you want to post the training online and have everyone be able to analyze it. Exactly, and it's also important to mention that we uh, during the pandemic we have had like a free offer for for most countries outside of of Scandinavia. Uh, it's only Sweden, Norway, and. Uh, Australia, the eventor countries, uh, all the other countries has been on the, like a, a completely free because we wanted to show the product and we, we wanted to also attract users to see what it is. And now we are gradually uh, transitioning to a paid model, which will be in effect from August on. So if you're outside Scandinavia at the moment, uh, you can still do most of the things for free but in, in August, we will start to charge uh, and have like one unified model for the whole world. Okay. What's the deal with, with Switzerland, by the way? I saw that there are some features that Switzerland is an exceptional. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we had a good cooperation with the, the Swiss Argentine Federation in this matter. So what it's all about that uh, they are... Uh, introducing LiveLox as their official tool for storing all the courses from their like main events from the Swiss championships and also their like the the, uh, the national events there, uh, and then uh, they do some marketing for us and really uh, makes it available for for everybody. And then we are having like the full feature set for them uh, a little bit longer for this transition, just to get people used to it and see. Uh, what it is and being able to enjoy the full feature set and then at some I point we, we start to charge cool i, I mean uh, i think i think that you know from you from your side it's a win from this swiss side is a win as well and I, I would love to see more countries like this for example czech republic i think it's a good example it's right next to my you know on, on the other side of my border 
And so, so I'm going to Czech Republic um, usually several times a year. But the last time I went uh, to the competition and I asked them if there's going to be live logs, they said, no, no, we have our own solution for it. And, and yes, they do have their own solution. It's not awesome. <laughs> I'm not afraid to say it. It's not awesome. And the courses were published like a week after the event. Yeah, so I already forgot about it totally. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't like it at all. So, you know. Let, let me the, just guess what, uh, how that is set up. And that is not to blame uh, like that system, but it's probably because it's not that easy to add the, the map and, and the courses as an organizer. So you have maybe to email some guy that does it for you and then it will be a delay. Uh, and, and it's not like a, such a big uh, feature set that we provide. And then it's maybe not that interesting and it's harder also as a participant to add things. So, so that's why it's not really taken off there, I suppose. But I mean, I'm also part of this. <laughs> I, I'm biased in this uh, sense. Definitely, but I'm not. <laughs> so I can I can say as a user that I didn't enjoy uh, the other tool as much as I, I enjoyed live logs. And you know, if, if someone from Czech Republic is watching you guys, you can push some buttons on your side. <laughs> as as a Swiss team demonstrated, uh, there are things to to be gained from cooperating. Yeah, and actually what Tommaso has been focusing on since he joined the team in uh, uh, last October is just to reach out to countries outside of our uh, like home market of Scandinavia to, to explain what Lilox is and to help organizers and, and to get it started. And we actually see now this spring has been really amazing in that sense that many people are picking it up in, in, uh, in several countries to, to uh, so we see it uh, is growing there. Um, and also one important thing uh, is that in Sweden and Norway, it's uh, live is so well integrated in our uh, event calendar, which is event tour. Uh, so, so then it's, it's easy to see it there. It's next to result picks, the result list, there will be live box links. So people are getting aware of that live box exists. And in that sense, everybody will gain from it because there will be more tracks added and so on. So uh, we would like to do that also in other countries, but we also know that maybe some countries don't have the resources to provide a national event calendar with those kinds of integration. So it's, it's like a, a, a balance there. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, what are the most common problems people have with using the tool? Yeah, we have one support uh, section where, where in case of some some problem, some issue, or or whatever, people can can reach out to us, and we can either support to set up the event. If, uh, for example, you cannot really do it, you have some problems, so you can email there, or, or if you see any any uh, problems or something. But uh, if I have to pick one uh, thing that is like uh, recurring. And it's kind of connected to live logs, but not directly connected to live logs. Is this Strava API? Because sometimes when we have a lot of, like if it is a weekend with a lot of uh, tracks going on, so uh, we have a certain limits that Strava allows us to to upload every every fifteen minutes. So it can be that during that half an hour there is like a lot of tracks, so your track will be queued after after many uh, uh, other tracks so you don't see it uh, immediately so that can be a little bit annoying we we know this one we are uh, actually reaching out to to strava and they answered just some uh, last week maybe something like this that they are updating their their development developer uh, program so that's something that we are we are constantly working and uh, we hope to to solve uh, as fast as possible, because we know that it can be uh, a little bit annoying when your track is not immediately there. Yeah, and I can understand the problem because usually the competition starts at the same time everywhere around Europe. <laughs> so like at, at 10 o'clock is the beginning of the competition and from 11 to 12 probably there's a peak where people are uploading. Yeah, definitely. And we see that also in like uh, Tuesday and Thursday evenings in Sweden are the like um, the popular training 
times and then we see the same queuing and it's really unfortunate actually with this Strava they are not super helpful I would say to uh, for services like ours that has been growing uh, quickly and then we are still on the limits that were suitable like five years ago but they don't increase it for us and then we got stuck in this situation but we hope it will improve when they launch their new developer program later this year so uh, so bear with us uh, I would like to add another problem that we can see it's also uh, um, not really connected to Lilux at, as is but it's the issue of creating multiple accounts user accounts so then you add one user account at some point and you add your Garmin connector Strava to that one. And then you forgot your login details, you create another account and then you, you lose uh, those uh, uh, connections and you don't understand why. And then they reach out to us and we help them to like just merge those uh, multiple accounts. But that's, uh, that's something that we is pretty common, I would say. Okay, okay, got it. Um... How does Livebox protect proprietary data like maps, map ownership? I think it might be important for the competition organizers as well. Very important. So that's maybe the most uh, important responsibility that we have uh, as, uh, as event organizers uh, or as, as software providers to provide for event organizers. And uh, well, I can, I've been event organizer myself. I've been organizing Swedish championships and core setters for Uringen and so on. So I know the importance uh, there. And we also know that at some point it has happened that uh, maps and courses have been uh, published way before they should just by, uh, by accident. And that gets a huge consequences. And it was the European champs in Portugal, right? Where, where they just published the wrong map 2014, I think. Uh, I think so. Yeah, I, I know some cases that happened in Poland too. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. And uh, so that's very, very important. But usually when those things happen, it's, they, it's, it's a human error, uh, more or less. It's not yes. the problem of, of a software. But what we can control is to make it super easy and super uh, clear when the maps and courses will be published, the time and date. Maybe we can be even clearer to say just a weekday. Uh, we don't do that, but uh, that might be uh, if you enter the wrong date, you can still say, oh, my race is not on a Saturday, it's on a Sunday. Um, so, uh, so those things. Uh, but when it comes to like basic computer security and so on, we have like two-factor authentication with the administrator accounts and we have uh, like reviewing the, uh, the security uh, from a computer and software point of view. But I think the most important is to make it clear for users so they understand when to when the maps are published and, and so on. But it's also a shift, uh, I mean, to publish your map on the internet and virtually anyone can make a screenshot and use the map and go around themselves there. And maybe that's not so good when it comes to landowners and so on. Yeah. Uh, and it's different in different parts of the world. We are lucky in Sweden to have a pretty uh, uh, liberal view on uh, sure. rights to, to land, but that's not the case in every country. So, so it's a little bit like common sense, I would say, for that part. Uh, but from, for us, as I said, it's really important to have uh, good protections and maps shouldn't leak out to people that shouldn't see them. But that's a shared responsibility of of um, core setters and users, uh, organizers using good passwords and don't share accounts and so, so on. So it's like what you should do uh, as a user of online services uh, generally. Yeah, I think another feature that is connected with this is that you can choose whether the map that you're using is downloadable or not. Yeah, we, so we uh, got a few requests regarding that, that, that it shouldn't be possible to download a, the map as a file but as we all know it's possible to make a screenshot anyway yeah. uh, to, to use it so you can't protect yourself from that if it's on the internet and somebody would like to use it they will do and we've seen the same thing in like every digital industry like from music and movies and so on so so that's uh, something that comes with a digital era i suppose yeah i think so um can you discuss an interesting or, or unexpected use cases for live loss beyond its original intended purpose for orienteering races? 
Actually, my wife was interested in it as well. Is LiveLux used outside of orienteering anywhere? Well, yes, we have seen some, some uses that people are going for like outdoor activities and other sports. We uh, helped out at some like uh, long distance cross country ski race in Sweden and so on. But it's not that common. Uh, we are trying uh, to reach out to other sports to get them to use live locks. Uh, but we haven't been that successful actually so far. It's a tool that's very directed to orienteering. So I can't really on, on, on top of my head present any spectacular use case. Can you, Tommaso? I think to me actually one that we looked through uh, some some time ago that I, I, I tried to reach out to the guy, but maybe the, the email went, went lost. That was really, really special is some uh, in Hong Kong, he was using it so he got the ferry to go somewhere then do his, uh, some course or something or but it was some maybe trail running or bike and then again on the ferry so it was pretty cool to see all the ferry trips and then back that was a little bit i didn't really understand what was the the idea behind how he then used that data what he wanted to to visualize but that was something like very unique uh, i would say and then I think I saw it at least in Norway here. It was used a little bit with this uh, ski mountaineering uh, randonnée in the in the winter. So they, they basically went up to, to the mountain and then come down. And so you can see all the different tracks of, of people uh, going up. But 99% of the moment is either orienteering or uh, rogaining. Yeah, I, I wouldn't expect that otherwise, because it, I think that the, the biggest value that it brings is for post-race analysis. And uh, the other sports are maybe more focused on online um, tracking, right? And since there are many other tools for this, it's probably hard for you guys to squeeze into that space. Again, yeah, orienteering is quite uh, special because it's maybe one of the only sports where you have you don't have a course to follow. So it yeah, is your exactly. course to, to do and, and route choices. While like a marathon is not that you can decide how you want to reach exactly, the finish. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, on the other hand, it might be interesting to do some live tracking uh, in other races uh, in endurance sport. For example, I did the Swedish uh, long distance ski race this year, Vasa Loppet. Uh, and then I put my tra uh, this uh, uh, live tracker uh, in my pocket. Uh, which was really good because uh, my partner, she could follow me along the course and drive the car and, and the chair for me. And she knew where I was all the time and could be really like precise. Uh, and uh, that's not the case for most people going there and help out and share for their, uh, uh, for their friends who are doing the, the ski race. So that's something that we might think of in the future, but that also requires this live tracker or that you have our mobile app that is doing the live tracking. Got it, got it. All right, uh, so I would love, uh, and I talked about uh, this with Tommaso also before you came in, Matt, I would love for us to also record a tutorial on how to add a relay race, because I think that this is the part where uh, many of the organizers are struggling with. So I, I'm not going to go into the details of like, uh, or specifics of something tricky like interval training, uh, but I have a question about that. So we, we'll, maybe I will ask it later, but I think it, it, uh, uh, it would be awesome to have like um, a recording somewhere available online of how to um, go through registering a relay race so that the competition organizers have it a little bit easier when it comes to doing it by themselves. And since I have this amazing opportunity of having you guys here, I don't have to record it myself. <laughs> I can ask you as experts to just explain everything from, uh, from the beginning uh, to the end. So if you're willing to do that, I know that Tommaso, I asked him before the, uh, when we started the recording, I know he has some files prepared. So Tommaso, you can share the screen. And, yeah, I think, I think uh, Matt, Matt, you had this, yeah, this actually, relay. Yeah, I, oh, yeah. I have prepared a relay uh, cool. race, so uh, I can try to... Let me know if you can share the screen. If not, I yeah, will give uh, you the permissions. Let me see. Yeah. Uh... Okay, I can see that it's loading, so, so yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, so, um, uh, let me start uh, to just uh, show this is a, like a sample relay that's set up just for uh, educational purposes. Um, so it's a small, uh, uh, small relay, uh, very simple one. It's one course, one class, and we have uh, for you uh, guys uh, familiar with the uh, OCAD. We have like a, a short working in the beginning. Mm -hmm. We just do like this uh, with uh, three uh, different controls in the beginning, and then we have first and second leg. We'll have just have one uh, one variant towards the finish and. Uh, uh, the third leg will have a different. It's a pretty typical setup for a, a three-leg relay. Mm -hmm. uh, so what you can do uh, in a super easy way with this um, uh, OCAD Livelox integration is to uh, to pick a core setting and uh, uh, upload to Livelox. Now my OCAD is in Swedish. I hope you can follow this one. Uh, but anyway. Uh, this is uh, uh, the way to do it in the simplest way. Uh, so then you pick uh, that one and you have to save the file first. Okay, let's save it. Uh, okay, there you go. Uh, and uh, then you got to this window in, uh, in OCAD that gives you the possibility to set the quality and so on. So most of this would be just pre-selected. And what you do is to you know, click this control button can just see that this is this is fine and then you go for uh, for uh, upload which will take you uh, to your browser and uh, uh, right into livelox so if you haven't uh, set up this uh, ocad livelox integration uh, previously you will be asked to just allow ocad to send data to livelox on behalf of your account uh, so you do that, and you also have to log in here to uh, to do this for the first time. Now I'm logged in here, and everything is just presented for me. You can see that the georeferencing is fine uh, by doing this slider. So you see, yeah, this map seems to be in the right place. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the uh, the choice of creating a new event uh, or to update an existing event in Linux. So usually you go for the new event, uh, and then you are clicking next. And then you are presented with this screen where you give the details of the event. So here is when you where you set the start time uh, for the event. Uh, so it starts uh, eleven o'clock today, uh, and it ends let's say thirteen. Uh, so it's a lunchtime event. You can put the. the, the time zone is pretty important, and it will pick that from the browser. Uh, so. So what you do here is to fill in those those details, and you say who will be uh, who will be uh, organizing this event. So it's important to pick the right event type. So now it's preselected for individual. Maybe we can automate automate this actually, but now you have to pick relay there, uh, and it's only me that should be able to administer this event. Uh, so uh, and that's basically it. Clicking save there. Uh, you see that the map would be there, uh, the courses would be there. Uh, mm -hmm. You have no classes yet. So that is uh, something we are going to add. Uh, one important thing to notice here is that the access restrictions. So it will be uh, published at 1 uh, p.m. Uh, it's exactly the time that we said that the event will end. You can you can change right. this, but let this be for now. But this is very important, so you don't release the courses too early. Uh, but let's go there and edit, uh, or just go edit there, and there will that will be more of a uh, way to see that everything is nice. Uh, oh, sorry, that was the map. Uh, I wanted to check the courses. Uh, so the courses. Uh, so this is like the, the forking is, that we have. And for a relay, we all know that it can be like a hundred variants of forkings. And to make things efficient, Lilox would just pick the ones that are like spanning the whole forking tree as I like to express it. So that every like control and every leg uh, of each course will be included, but not necessarily all the variants. So not yeah, and a, I think it a, makes sense. A, a, B, a, a, C, and so on. 
yes. uh, but just the ones that are needed to, to like make the whole course tree. Uh, you can see the controls and where they are placed. So this is just for like previewing features and you see what course is using. You're, what you are most concerned about is to go to the preview one. Uh, where you see all the controls, you can also see all these courses and you can, uh, you can get a nice uh, view of it. And if we zoom in a little bit here and check the details, you can see that this looks nice because we have these cut lines and cut control surface that uh, resembles the race map the most. And uh, at least for me, that's important like uh, uh, aesthetically to have it like that because then uh, it's not, yeah, it, it looks nice. The control numbers are in the right way. So that's all, everything is included there uh, from MOCAD. And that is something that comes in these course print files, like everything that's purple on the map more or less is included in the special file. You don't get that if you have just this XML file upload that you did previous to this right. uh, to this um, uh, OCAD integration. Anyway, things are looking good there. Uh, so let's just cancel that one. We don't do any changes. And now uh, you have to set up the classes uh, and assign the, uh, the courses to each class. Uh, normally you don't need to do that for an individual race. Then you are asked, do we want to uh, create one course or one class per course? But here it's a little bit different because you have so many fork things. Uh, so you go to classes and uh, you add one class. Uh, so this is my relay class. Uh, and there are three legs here. And then this relay leg options button uh, will be visible after entering the number of legs. And you also have the courses. So this is the screen where you're connecting the classes to courses and also which leg of a, a relay that would uh, has which course. So in this setup, uh, we say that, uh, yeah, all these uh, courses are belonging to, uh, or to this class. This class will have these three courses, but they are not evenly distributed on the legs because we have a special course for the last leg. Um, as I explained. Mm -hmm. So then uh, you have to go into this options screen. And we have leg one, two, three. You also have the possibility to, uh, to name these legs, but we normally don't do that. So what is then happening is that we have first and second leg of this relay will have like their own forking group. And the last leg will have its own. So we... Uh, we use these forking groups when not all legs are using all courses. Uh, so what we do there now is add, adding two uh, forking groups. One forking group for the relay leg one and two. So I enter one and two there. And I say that these two legs will have uh, these forkings. Uh, and then uh, I add another one. Uh, for leg three, then we'll have this one. Uh, so, so that's how we set it up there. Uh, and actually, I think maybe we need to do some improvements here uh, because now we have a special setup where, where one of the forkings uh, will be just belong to third leg. So maybe this won't work as I uh, wanted to do. Then you need to do some, some adjustment actually to export more courses. Uh, but let's go for this uh, as of now and see how it turns out. Uh, but the idea is to have, yeah, these uh, relay legs will share th those two courses and uh, we have a special forking on, on uh, leg three uh, and then you like that uh, and then you save it. Uh, and then you can, uh, what you can do as an administrator, now I am administrating this one. So I can go to show here and then you can see that uh, what you get that only you can access these ones until the, the, the time of the event. Uh, and you see that we, we can do a, either a replay of all legs, we can do leg one individually, leg two individually, uh, and leg three individually, but also leg one and leg two, they are using the same courses. So it's of interest to compare those two ones to each other. So you can mm -hmm. have leg one runner with leg two runner. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, so that's basically it. Uh, 
and if you now go to to this one you can you can show uh, how leg one and leg two uh, looks like and then you you get this uh, and as i said yeah we probably need to add also the leg uh, three variant because we just have two forkings here so that's actually something we have to improve but anyway, I think you get the, the main uh, idea there, how to add a relay uh, event to Livebox. Yeah, so basically, the, the, I think the, the biggest um, challenge for the organizers is to figure out how to combine the different variants to yeah, uh, yeah. So, so that it's shown properly. Exactly, and we are actually, uh, I think that's a combination of uh, how the courses are exported from from OCAD and uh, how we are handing them to reducing the number of variants into into live So we have this like uh, the problem uh, we could say. But how to overcome that would be to use you can you can use in OCAD you can use uh, course setting export and then you export an IOF XML file version three and then then you can like import that one and and go go to uh, to reduce uh, forking variants. So um, yes, you can you can handle that. But it's a little bit tricky, and as we know, because forkings are tricky, and there will be like many variants, and it's a little bit hard to to compare everything. So, uh, but anyway, uh, that's and and I, and I guess that in in a simplest scenario possible, basically you could, as an organizer, you could just um, export an XML file. Let's say you don't have the um, OCAD that can connect to Livebox with this new feature, right? So you can export the XML file. And then you can just combine all of the forkings, all of the courses into one and yeah, yeah. share it for everyone, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that's correct. So, so just let me show that quickly. I'm saving this as a XML file, and then you will get like, yeah, this is how it looks. Uh, you don't need to go into detail there. And then you go up to, to here, you go edit your, your race and you upload that one. Uh, the same field, uh, file as you created, and then um, yeah, you, you get an uh, an idea there. So so that's uh, that's how you do it if you don't have this uh, OCAD integration. Cool. So, Thank you. Yeah, I think I think that's it. Yeah. Good. Uh, so another question that I have not connected with the relays, but maybe a little bit. So very often um, when we're doing the relay kind of training, we're actually doing it with restarts. So we were running intervals. How do you put that into live looks effectively, efficiently? Uh, so what you would like to do uh, is to have uh, like specific starting points of the interval and finishing points of an interval. And you would, would like to move a little bit from the finish to the like resting place yeah. and then have a little bit of a distance from the resting place to the start point because in that way you will get this the algorithm in Livebox that calculates the split times mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. when you pass a control then it won't be affected by small inaccuracies in the um, in the uh, gps tracks uh, so you don't got like one minute of uh, of rest included in the time from the start to the first control of an interval if you okay. follow what I, what I mean so um, it's always go good to have um, um, the start of each interval not where you are resting between the intervals or where you are like jogging around but give it like 50 meters or something for the starting point on the, on the map yeah so so you get uh, as accurate split times uh, as you can, because okay. that and live looks will be okay with multiple starts and mul multiple finishes at one course. Yeah, yeah, uh, will be. So it's like a start and a finish would be treated as a control when it is in the middle of a course. So that's uh, that's fine. Okay, because I was also thinking about the solution where you can, you know, use your watch to record several training sessions. Really, during every interval is a separate training session, and then you can you can post four different maps to live looks, but that's probably not very. Effective. No, that's that's will require you to switch between classes. You would like to have everything in the same uh, screen, so you yeah. don't need to reload. So I would suggest to make one course with lots of small courses into it. So so that's the way to go there. All right, cool. Let me see if I have anything else. Um, I think last one. 
that I have on the list here, and it's almost almost perfect in terms of time. So what advice would you give to other entrepreneurs or developers who are looking to create software platforms for niche sports or activities like orienteering? Is it worth the struggle? I mean, I'm doing this, uh, and I think you also, Tomas, are doing this not to, to earn a lot of money because it's not a lot of money. <laughs> you need to be dedicated and really into the community. Uh, and I mean, we all know that orienteering is not a, a, a sport where it can be a multimillionaire, but you're, you're doing it because you love the sport. So, so first you need to pick something that you're really interested in uh, when it's the niche product. Uh, and then you should also pre prepare that it takes time. It takes time to grow. It takes time to improve your product and to get people to understand that the product is out there. That will be my learnings uh, from this journey what would you say Tommaso? yeah i think i think it's just a lot about about passion i think because uh it's uh it's what it takes it's not there's not so many uh people also taking part in orienteering for sure if you do something with like some running i'm thinking about this uh park runs that they have uh, every week those they have a lot more more runners than 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 orienteering like simple road running is is a sure. totally different word in that sense so for for orienteering is more uh small but uh as i mentioned before the the community is, is great so if the product is nice uh, people really appreciate it and really use it cool I have definitely one of the people that do appreciate it. So thank you uh, very much, guys, for putting your time and effort into developing this tool. Uh, I'm a, I'm definitely a big fan, and nobody had to convince me to to this. I just saw this tool, tested it once, and I'm like, wow! I want to use it every training I have. <laughs> I also want to um, thank all the organizers that are actually taking their time to put those events into live logs so that we as runners users can enjoy uh, the analysis later on. I think this is super important as well. Um, amazing time, guys, amazing chat. It was so nice meeting you and learning uh, everything that we were talking about uh, regarding live logs, some bit of history, uh, some bit of uh, history of other tools as well. That, that was definitely surprising, Matt. So uh, all in all, um, it's been definitely a blast for, from, from my side. Thank you so much for joining. And hopefully we will have more opportunities, maybe somewhere in the future to uh, talk again, maybe even cooperate, who knows? Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be part of the show. Yeah, thanks again. And if uh, people want to, to reach out, they can, they can write us on the socials, on, on emails for feedbacks, for questions, for uh, whatever. Absolutely. Uh, I'll make sure that all the links are posted in the description of the video. Thanks again. Thank, Thank you. you.